Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge & Company. In New York politics, Jerry Skernick is in a class by himself. He's the political consultant to political consultants, and he plays a crucial role behind the scene of every election. And he's my guest today. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> so you are, in a funny way, you're the very basic ingredient. You provide the very basic ingredient for a campaign. Uh, in some ways, yeah. We... Uh what do you we, do? <laughs> well, primarily, I mean, we do some other, we do some political consulting, but primarily what we do is we sell data to political campaigns. Uh, we get the information from the boards of elections and enhance it and provide campaigns with what used to be actual lists and labels. Now it's usually data files for them to do mailings or telephone calls or texting, emails. Uh, so we often know uh, what's going on in each campaign and uh, have to keep it a secret from each other. <laughs> and you love it all. Uh, you're, you're basically a political junkie to begin with. Yeah, I got into this through politics, not yeah. through computers. I still, you know, <laughs> still a rudimentary uh, knowledge of what I'm doing computer. on the computer. My business partner knows a bit more about computers, but he got into it through politics yeah. also. Take um, a city council race and a candidate decides they're going to run. They want to know, it's important for them, how many, how many voters are there? How, how do you, uh, in, the, in the apportionment of a district, districts are apportioned by population, right? Right. So congressional districts are what, 400,000? Uh, it's up to, I it's think, 700,000 700,000. Yeah. It's like a taxi medallion right. from my time, how much it's worth now. But anyway, and what's a council district? How many voters? Uh, well, it's population. Uh, it's actually... I mean, population, right. I think council districts are 160,000 or 170,000. I'm not exactly sure. So when they reapportion the district, the city, and they move all these counts, they have to somehow do the lines that it represents around 170,000 people living there. That's from the census. Right. Okay. Then, if you're running in that district, you've got 170,000 people living there, but you want to know how many people vote. You want to know how many people vote. In, and, then it, what, and in New York City, it's usually decided in Democratic primaries, you know, there about five to ten districts were right. competitive for both parties. Uh, so people will want to know how many Democrats and then how many Democrats are likely to vote in a primary. And, and, then, that's, and you call those Democrats likely to vote? They, they, when, since when, <laughs> I started in, when you, I started in politics, it's when I first met you, they were called prime voters, and that's yeah. how we actually came up with the name, name of our is, company, yeah. Prime New York. Uh, so, yeah, it's, so it's people who are likely to vote in the primary. Now, that doesn't stop with that, that list, though. Then well, you then can so, divide that all up. Right, then people may want to know how many men versus women, how many are likely to be Hispanic or German or Russian, uh, how many might be senior citizens, how many may be newly registered, uh, where they live, you know, some districts, there's a major difference between one part of the district and the other, and they may say, you know, which are the people who live in, you know, the southern part of the district? Uh, do you have can you do it by income also? Well, census data has been added to it, so we can tell if you live in a census tract what the medium income is. It's not 100%, like most of this is not 100% accurate. You know, the, the janitor living on Park Avenue, Mm, but that's it, rare. It, yeah, that's rare. Right. And the guy who owns a slum ward may actually be registered to vote in the, in the slum. Yeah. Uh, but, but the only thing that almost, you know, is, always, is ac completely accurate is uh, what party you're registered in and what uh, your gender and age are, because that's what, that's what the voter actually provides to the Board of Elections. So, that, so you go down to the... Now, do you, does, do you still go to the Board of Elections and look in the books? No. No, no more. What do they have down there? <laughs> it's the, 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 when we first started, that's what we used to do. Uh, we actually, we started in, 1960, in 1988, and we sent people down to the Board of Elections with computer printouts of the voters, and then they had these books that listed each voter and what their voter history was, and, they, and then when they marked up the computer printouts. But now... Uh, the, when people vote, they sign something that has their, a barcode for their voter identification number, and it's now contained on the tape, the tape that the Board of Elections provides to, uh, to us or anybody else who wants to buy it. But they, they don't select it. I mean, they don't tell you, 
you can't say, I'd like to know the voter, the African American voters in such no, that, and that such the, a the ethnic information is something we we you do differently. We do it by an ethnic dictionary and sen and sense. Well, ethnic dictionary for most groups. African Americans is more difficult because. What is know, an ethnic dictionary? An ethnic dictionary would be saying that you know, Shapiro is a Jewish name, O'Malley oh, is an Irish name. Oh, so you go through. By well, names. Well, I don't do it. It's but a, somebody does. Right. Who's the person who does that? Well, no, it's done by a computer. So, oh, I yeah, see. It's all electronic so is the now. Computer, is the computer person in your office? No, no. Well, we, we actually work with a national company called Labels and Lists. Uh, we previously worked for another company that was recently taken over by Labels and Lists. And they, they do this for the whole country. And it's, it's almost like a franchise. Not exactly, but, but we're there in New York representative and we get the data from them. I mean, we help them out by giving them tips on New York mm -hmm. that, for example, in New York City, m most people with German and Polish surnames are actually Jewish, while in Buffalo, they're going to be not Jewish. So, uh, but they could go wrong, too. Oh, it always goes wrong with last names. <laughs> I mean, Ronnie Eldridge is not in our Jewish right. dictionary. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but it's good. So it's very interesting, the, yeah. the whole thing. Then you can also, so a, can, so a candidate's campaign wants to know what the composition of the district is. Right. right? Then I guess they're going to want to know what else? The voters, who's going to be likely to vote, right? Right, and they want to they know some information about the people likely to vote, what percentage are mm -hmm. in either in certain parts of the district or what are they the same ethnic group of the, as the candidate, the same gender. You know, uh, and then do you you can also in a way find out what the interests are, can't you? Well, there's some cons like I said, we've we've matched some consumer data, so we could tell if certain people have contributed to environmental causes or or gun owners uh, or uh, political campaigns. Can, yeah, campaigns. If they've given to uh, if they subscribe to a religious magazine, uh, some of that. Uh, now, how does that all? How is that all compiled? The religious magazine sells its list? That's right. They sell their list, and uh, same way, yeah, and that's how we get email addresses also. Uh, uh, <laughs> just like, you know, when you, you, you subscribe to some magazine, and then a few months later, you get an advertisement for a magazine that's similar to it. That's because the magazine sold your name uh, to a list broker. Similarly, when you sign up for email, sometimes people sell those to list brokers and they, they're commercially available and we match, well labels and lists matches it to the voter file. It's interesting, how many people do you think understand that whole process? I mean, here we've got all this debate about uh, privacy, <laughs> national security, yeah. meanwhile. Yeah, vo voting is a public record. I mean, there are sometimes uh, when there are cases of stalking, uh, people can contact the local board of elections, and they will remove their name from the public voter file that's sold, that oh. they make available. Uh, I mean, there are not many cases like that, but uh, they, you know. So if you actually have a, a legitimate privacy uh, reason, uh, they won't they won't make it available. But otherwise, everybody who's registered to vote, uh, you know, periodically you'll see a story in the newspaper uh, mm -hmm. about. Right. You know, some celebrity didn't vote in an election when they did a uh, commercial yeah. to say to come out to vote. Uh, oh, I see. I think one year with Madonna had yeah. done a get out to vote commercial, and then somebody wrote that she actually didn't vote that year. Yeah. Uh, so was her name in the books, though? I, I don't. Oh, you don't know? Yeah, I don't know. Okay. So do you do any issue uh, st polling? or You well, don't, don't do any actual polling? We don't do the polling, no. We provide the data to a number of pollsters. But, uh, and this is an industry that has grown very quickly, enormously. Uh, we, yeah, when we started, I mean, we, we turned out we started just when it was changing. Like I said, we started yeah. doing it partially by hand. And before most people were on the internet, uh, we used to, the way we used to place orders was type it up and fax it to the company we were working with then, which was based in Hawaii. <laughs> and then they used to print labels or lists and ship them uh, and we often had to pick them up at the airport because it was coming in from Hawaii and then you know now everything is uh, through email and, and or so amazing. FTP sites and things like that. Yes. So tell, t the evolution, you've watched the evolution of the Board of Elections. 
Yes. Has it changed as much as it should would have one would have expected it to? Uh, I mean, it's changed. I mean, the uh, uh, I mean, well, one thing it changed when we used to get the the tape. We used to get a literal tape because the old you know those big computer tapes mm -hmm. uh, from the Board of Elections. And those are the papers that folded up. Is that what you mean, the runs? No, but I mean the tape that, that, that oh. those that produced oh, those I papers. See. Okay. Uh, they used to come on like four, you know, big Wheel. wheels of tape, and they used to cost five thousand dollars from the Board of Elections. And uh, now you get it on CDs, and it's two hundred dollars for the whole city of New York. Uh, and does that money go into the general revenue fund, or does that go to the Board of Elections? Because uh, we're I don't always know. talking about underfinancing the Board of Elections. I, I don't know, yeah. actually. I'm, I didn't uh, mean to ask you a question that you don't know, but anyway. Yeah, I, well, it's interesting. It, part of it is it was a lawsuit. Uh, even not not showing the city board, uh, the uh, in Erie County in Buffalo, uh, when they first started making tapes available, they, the board of elections used to give it free to the Democratic and Republican parties, but they used to charge anybody else who wanted it, and it was like fifteen hundred dollars. And they went to court, and the court of appeals ruled that there it was public information, and the board of elections had to make it available at cost. And then the decision decided what cost was, and, <laughs> then it, and I remember one small county, their cost was what it cost to, for the disc that they put it on. Well, the city, New York City, claimed that the cost was, you know, all their employees divided by something, and it was, they dropped the cost from five thousand dollars to like fifteen hundred dollars. <laughs> but then they finally had to drop the cost when it yeah. became. But do you you don't just provide information for New York City? You do the state. We do the state, and actually, because the label is in list, we have access to the whole oh, country. The I mean, we don't do a lot outside New York, but we, we do some. And are there any campaigns that don't come to you? Uh, yeah. There are, there's Who else a, is doing the kind of work you're doing? Well, there other it companies? turns out both the Democratic National Committee and the Republican National Committee now have their own voter files that they sponsor, and, uh, and so a lot of campaigns actually use, uh, use them rather than us. Plus, there are people who just get it from the Board of Elections themselves and can manipulate it. When we first started, there used to be one or two, one or two campaigns that used to get the tape from us and claim they can do it themselves, and half the time they couldn't. They, they bought it from us, and they said, oh, we can't manipulate it. Uh, but now, you know, there's so many kids who know so much more about computers than, you know, uh, than any of us do, that they can actually get it from the Board of Elections and manipulate it themselves. We don't have purges, do we, the way they do in other st states or... Well, it's actually the, through? The, the, the federal law now, the, the help, uh, the, the motor voter law, yeah. uh, it's, it's now the same way for every state, that uh, if you don't vote in four years, uh, this, the Board of Elections is supposed to contact you, send you a, a non-forwardable piece of mail, and if it comes back, they can purge you. But they don't purge people for just not voting. And is that all handled by, by computers? Uh, I assume so. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, the board, the, the board, at least the city board, still does other things. They're used in national change of address to see who moved out of the state, and they get Department of Health death notices. Uh, but there's still what you call a lot of dead wood on the voter file. People who, for example, you know, you'd, if a, a child goes to college, not a, a young adult mm -hmm. goes to college, and doesn't move back home, mm -hmm. uh, the mail will still get delivered to his parents, so they will never know that he moved away and is now maybe in California or something. So when a, when a campaign gets mail back, do they tell you? Sometimes, and we tell them. We'll send it, you know, total board of elections to the post office. Is, you know, we, we're not going to remove people from the voting rolls. No, not you our can't job. do that. Yeah. Now, do you, is there any difference, do you think, in the registration um, and the voting with the new, new method of voting instead of the machines? Do you notice any difference in any of it? I don't, it doesn't look like it's affected turnout any. Yeah, uh, yeah. and nothing with your, the accuracy of your, your records or anything like that. Uh, no, because that's based on what, they, what the sheet you sign in on, and that hasn't changed any. I mean, the main change I think that will eventually happen with the new voting machines is I think write-in candidates will do better. Mm -hmm. Maybe not in a general election or in a Democratic or Republican primary, but I think write-ins can now 
have a good chance of winning a minor party yeah. contest. I mean, it's already happened in some outside the city. Mm -hmm. I mean, the old days, That's I mean, okay. well, the present days, actually, because we're going to be yeah. using the lever right. machines, yeah. you used to have to do like three different things with yeah. two hands in order to do a writer. Now you already have a pen in your hand you and a piece write. of paper on the right in I front see, of you. See, you just right. You know, you, um, the campaign finance, uh, let's talk about politics now because that's what got you into this whole thing, right? You're yeah. a kid? Yep. Yeah. I've known you since you were really, what, in high school? Uh, I, was in, <laughs> I was in college, in but, college. Uh, but I actually went to college when I was, in, in, <laughs> when I was 16, so yeah. yeah. I, <laughs> so you, you're, you're like, uh, you were born interested in politics. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you never, you, did you get into real campaigning and stuff? You worked in campaign. I worked in campaign. Yeah, I, wor I joined my local Democratic club when I was 16, and uh, that's how I got involved. I got involved through the local club, and mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and so this was a great way of finding a way to uh, make a living and still enjoy your fun, right? Right. Yeah. Well, I, I, I joke that I have no other skills. I, I I don't even drive, so I can't even be a cab driver. <laughs> <laughs> you the, you I've I've heard you talk about campaign finance. And the city, since you do both the state and the city, you can see a difference, can't you, in what happens in voting? Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm sorry I can tell. I remember a few years ago, Mayor, former Mayor Koch started this New York uprising, I think he called yes. it, about to try to change things in Albany. And they had this big meeting that people attended. And I, I said to some people that, you know, it's already too late. It was like March of the year. And if people aren't, aren't already running for the Assembly of State Senate and raising money, it's too late unless they're, you know, unless they're millionaires and they can put up their own money. It's not like the city council. The city council, if you had an issue, you could start running in, in the same mm -hmm. calendar year and raise enough money with the matching funds to mm -hmm. be a legitimate candidate. And, and I was proven correct. There weren't any, you know, most of the people who ran with the support of Koch's group were already running. There were any, yeah. weren't any new people coming out of the woodwork to run. So the most important, the campaign finance law, especially in New York City, because it's a one-party city, essentially, right? Essentially, I mean, makes, except for, except makes for mayor. The, <laughs> makes the primary vote, the primary election, much more important. And for local, I'm not, I'm not talking about city. Well, election. I mean, the primary was always important. What it means is it sort of leveled the playing field. I mean, insurgent candidates uh, can often have as much money or sometimes even more money than incumbents. Uh, and that's why you see more city council incumbents losing primaries than you see congressional, senate, or assembly incumbents. But isn't it shocking at how people can win primaries with some, in some extreme cases, 2,500 or 3,000 votes? Uh, yeah, well, we don't have a runoff for anything other than the three citywide offices. Uh, I personally think it would be a good idea to have a runoff for everything. Uh, other people want to do away with a runoff for mayor. mayor. Uh, Do the, does the number of enrolled voters, has that decreased as, we've, as time has gone on? Uh, to some extent, yeah. Uh, less and less people are, well, I think the number of enrolled voters probably hasn't changed that much, but the numbers who actually vote has been going down fairly steadily, except when they get excited like when Ob Obama running, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, traditionally in a presidential, when there's a presidential election, people register to vote a for lot. president, and then those people, they vote for president, but then they don't vote for anything in between. It just drives me crazy that so few people vote in an election and elect a leader, a, a, a legislator. It's oh yeah, I mean, this year, I mean, I, I think in the, we have just under three million registered Democrats. I, I believe there's going to be about 700,000 votes cast in the primary. and In the whole city. In the whole city. I'm way higher than almost everybody. As I, you know, smart people who I, you know, think I'm, I'm way high, that they think it's going to be closer to 600,000. I went through, you, you also publish a lot of figures. <laughs> right. We send out a newsletter every year with the election results, uh, which the New York Times used to publish most of it, but they stopped. Yeah. Uh, I may do some of it online now. They don't publish anything anymore. They don't even, they don't publish how you, how the senators and congressmen from the district vote on issues. Yeah. It's, all right, go on. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we send it out every year along with some, you know, basically as an advertisement for what else we're doing. Mm -hmm. And we mail it out to about 1,500 
people who are interested in politics, and you, uh, all but, potential customers. And you also, you also put it online. Uh, yeah, yeah. Because I went through it the other day. Yeah. <laughs> and Sheldon Silver, who holds the second most important job in the state, right, from what I did, and it wasn't a terribly, uh, you know, big, deep search, from what I gather, had the second lowest, was nominated or nominated in a primary with the second lowest number of voters in the city. Now, how do we have a government like that? Well, someone's always going to be the second I lowest. I shouldn't ask someone's you this question, <laughs> I know. But this is I the mean, second of, most important person in the state. Well, it, it, part, it actually has somebody who is district. His district includes uh, Chinatown, where there are a, a number of people who are living there but not citizens and can't vote. Uh, plus, it is, like, includes a lot of lower Manhattan where uh, uh, well, actually, in the last election, some of them didn't vote because of the hurricane. But, you know, so there may be reasons. <laughs> but, I mean, someone's always going to be the lowest. Someone's always going to be yeah, the but highest. but not the second most important person. Well, that's not, that's not how he's chosen to be speaker. It's not <laughs> I, he's done yeah, his, that's true. On his own district. Where did you go to high school? I actually went to uh, Stewart Park High School, in, which is in, now in Sheldon Silver's district. And to grade school? Uh, junior high school? Well, public school 64 and junior high school 71. So did you ever have civics in school? We had social studies. Social they studies. Called it. Yeah. And did that help develop your interest in it? I guess so. Yeah. I, I actually, you know, yeah, I hadn't thought about it, but mm. I, I was, I did pretty well in social studies. I'm, an, I'm on a tear. I think that the schools should be, should be teaching civics or so, yeah. more social studies yeah. because I don't think people have a sense that it's an obligation or responsibility. Yeah. You know, I was interested in it. Now that you mentioned yeah. it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And then go on. Tell me. Well, I actually think that I've, I've thought for a while about how I got into politics. I have an older brother, uh, 13 years older than me. We just, just, and he used to come home every day from work when I was growing up with the New York Post, which was then number one, published only in the afternoon, and then was a very liberal newspaper. Mm -hmm. And they covered a lot of local politics about, you know, the reform versus regular democratic politics. And I remember reading the he gave me the paper when he got home. And I think that was when I first started getting interested in, in at least the local politics. And your club was a local reform club that had not yet been an official club, was it? Or was it? Right. Yeah. When I, I got involved in, in 1966, and we actually won in 67. So, boy, that's great. I just get involved and we start winning. <laughs> and we started losing. I got involved in a lot of losing campaigns <laughs> after then. But it, and it was interesting because it was a time that I was very active in party politics and reform politics. And we were in the same congressional district. That's right. Congressman Farbstein. That's right. That's, and that's, had he been defeated yet? No. No, in six, 1966, the year I got involved was when... Uh, Ted Weiss? Counts, yeah, count, then Councilman Ted Weiss ran against him the first time. Uh, he ended up running against him three times and losing all three times. And then, and ten, then 10 years later, getting elected to Congress. Right. And, and before he lost three times, uh, Bill Haddad had lost. And, and an assemblyman named Bentley Cassell had lost. Right, right. So yeah. The poor Congressman Farbstein kept getting opposed every two years. Right, and it just shows you how politics has changed because, you know, <laughs> Farbstein had a. I remember trying to recruit a friend of mine from college who eventually became my roommate after I graduated from college to help out in the campaign. And he said, This guy has a pretty decent record, this Farbstein. I said, Well, you're right. 99% of the country would <laughs> be considered like a flaming liberal. Right. Uh, I, I don't think nowadays someone with Farbstein's record would have so much opposition. Yeah. Uh, it was the, the temper other, of the times, I think. The other interesting thing that I, I sort of saw when, from your data on the internet is that most of the congressional seats span more than one bu uh, borough. And nowadays, yeah, yeah, because of population changes. Well, it's a combination of population changes and the voting rights law. And I mean, it's so balancing it. Yeah, it is, you know, they, they have to preserve uh, minority districts as much as possible to, uh, so you find uh, the district that now represented by Hakeem Jeffries, who's African American, goes into Queens. He's basically Brooklyn, though. Right, it's mainly Brooklyn. And the district represented by Nydia Velasquez uh, goes into uh, Brooklyn and Queens. Uh, Where is she basically? It's mainly, it, I mean, most of the vote is uh, Bushwick, uh, 
Sunset Park, Hispanic parts of Brooklyn, but it, it goes as far into Corona and into parts of the Lower East Side. And Nadler? Uh, he has an Nadler goes into, also. yeah, he goes, he doesn't go as far as he used to into Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. He used to go as far as Coney Island. Uh, as, as well as part of the West Side. Right, right, yeah. yeah. Now it's gone further up the West Side and only gone as far, I think, Park Slope or something. But, uh, so it's a combination of, uh, you know, population. Uh, but this year, you know, the congressional lines or the list, this, these congressional lines are actually drawn by uh, an impartial mediator appointed right. by a federal judge. Right. So and it wasn't, it wasn't gerrymandered politically. It may have been gerrymandered for other reasons. And stuff, yeah. 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 So do you, um, do you think that under the new, it's an advance under the, the new, re, you know, legislation and requirements? What the, the, what? the way that it's drawn, the lines. Well, you know. It's complicating. Life. You know, like, like you, I started in politics as a, as a you know, small R reformer, and I've gotten more <laughs> cynical over the years. But the one thing I'm actually still small R reformer, and I do think it's nonpartisan redistricting is the right way to do it. I do think it's something wrong with politicians picking their own voters by drawing the lines. Uh, well, I'm glad we at least have an optimistic thing. Um, <laughs> what's your website? It's uh, primeny.com. We've come to the end of our program. Thank you so much, oh, Jerry great. Sternick. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore? Please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.